Mission Control, we are taking off in T minus three, two, one. Blast off and welcome to the Channel Teachers Podcast. I am Jay, your host, and of course, I am joined by my lovable crew, Brian and Tony. How you doing tonight, fellas? Doing well. Doing well. Hey guys. But yeah, uh, the reason I did the, uh, the, sp the, the, you know, NASA parody intro is because we will be talking about Adam Sandler's latest Netflix release. No, it's not a shitty comedy that he uses as an excuse to invite his friends to, uh, you know, nice vacation spots. It's a bearded Sandler movie that's actually a pretty deep journey of self-discovery and, you know, kind of the meaning of love and the importance of love and relationships and human connection directed by the director the of chernobyl writers. yeah yeah yep yep it, yeah it's really and, cool mm -hmm. and another fact about this particular film is that it's based on a novel Ooh. called baseman of bohemia i believe oh cool yeah um you know if if you guys have ever seen any uh bearded sandler uh, bearded sandler films like uh uncut gems or it's not a bearded Sandler film, but it is one of his more serious uh, films. Uh, funny People. I love Funny People. Uh, Punch Drunk Love. Any of those. Like, you will really enjoy this movie. But we'll get into that in a second. Because we can't start an episode off without first jumping right into the news with Brian. Alright, people. We, this is going to be another interesting week. Because there are a bunch of smaller news stories about one topic that I'm accumulating into one. And you guys know some of my Falcos, I mean, by you guys. Okay. And that is uh, Superman Legacy Updates. Nice. Okay. First of all, it's now going to be called just Superman. They yep. dropped the legacy. Yep, yep. I, rem I remember you saying that. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they did that is because when James Gunn was finished with the script, he realized that Legacy was not like appropriate for it and to just call it Superman that that was what was best for it. He also uh showed the suit logo which you can look up online for yourself. I've already shown the guys. Yep, it's very uh the S shield is very uh Kingdom Come inspired. Yeah. Yep. Which is a uh, of interesting way of going about it yeah i thought it was a little weird because i was like ah you know that s signifies like an older jaded superman kind of thing but you know th then i was like well no it's not it's not the you know it doesn't have the black color scheme to you know indicate that it's still like the bright yellow and red type thing so you know it might just be the yeah. s yeah it's yeah. the that's in the style of the kingdom come shield but it's just that it looks like it it isn't the exact shield that's on mm -hmm, his chest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, now we get to the, to the snippets that you don't know about, or at least I hadn't told you about. Okay. Uh, filming has already started to begin. Nice. Oh, nice. And they are starting in Norway. Oh, Fortress of Solitude doing... stuff. Yep. I mean, makes and sense. The last bit of news that we got is uh, the big boss himself. We got casting for Perry White. Nice. Great Caesars. Ghosts. That's a good, that's some good news. Mm -hmm. Yup. It's unexpected, but I think the guy will kill it. Okay. Uh, the actor's name is Wendell Pierce. Mm, what has he been in? If you've seen The Wire, he was Detective Funk. Oh, shit. Oh, but okay. uh, more recently, podcast watchers, because I think we covered the first season way back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also uh, in um, Jack Ryan. Oh, shit. Huh. Yeah, Greer. Oh, cool. Cool. And also, mo most recently, he can be seen in the show that uh, we reacted to the trailer, Elsbeth. Oh. Oh. He yeah, like, um, you know what I, w I, th I, th uh, I thought would have been funny? Like, I know it would never happen, but it would have been funny if they casted J.K. Simmons as Perry White. <laughs> hilarious. That would have been hilarious. But no offense to uh, Mr. Simmons. Perry White seems to give off a different sort of vibe that doesn't really mess well with him. Uh, no, that depends, because he's played softer roles. It's just people keep hiring him in asshole roles because he's very entertaining as an asshole. Oh, yeah. And I think that's the more... It, it's a, But I could say any actor can perform any role mm -hmm. to what you might get. You never really know. Unless you see it for yourself. Yeah. 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 I'm 
of the opinion that depending on who the kind of character is, there is a certain line of temperament that some actors try to inject a little too much or a little too well little uh it it also makes me wonder if uh you know this first movie is going to be very planet focused that's another good question like Maybe. like is it like is it going to be like an Aaron Sorkin film where uh, you know all it is is you know Clark running around the planet and then occasionally doing super heroics based on the stories that they're running like uh, maybe, mm. but we do we do know that several key players will be other leakers. So mm -hmm. yeah. maybe not. But it makes completely. Yeah. It makes, yeah. So thinking along similar lines of what Jay was saying, it kind of sounds like to me it's like a, a weird anthology film of, to some degree. I mean, I I could see I could honestly see I could honestly see it playing out like what I would actually want a Spider-Man film to be, uh, similar to the Raimi ones. But, like, actually put more focus on the supporting cast, in particular the Bugle. Because, you know, the, the Bugle family is what really helped shape Peter's character in his young adulthood and early adulthood. You know, Robbie Robertson was very much, you know, a, like a dad to him. J. Jonah Jameson was also, a, you know, a huge father figure to him. He never wanted people to see that he was, you know, a really sweet guy. But Jonah looked out for... For Pete, he saw a lot of himself in him, and he like fostered, you know, the creativity, and like even pushed him to actually start doing some reporting because he thought he was good at it. And like he gave him these extensions on like his photo deadlines because he knew that the kid could be good given time. And like whenever he was in actual trouble, like he paid for Matt Murdock to be his lawyer when he was falsely accused of murder. Uh, and Matt Murdock ain't cheap. Yeah, no, definitely not. But also. If you look at Wendell Pierce's stuff, mm -hmm. I could see him being very similar to the uh, Perry in uh, Superman and Lois. Oh, yeah. Recognize their ta the talent of the trio, but also just completely done with their shit. Oh, you mean you mean My Adventures with Superman? My Adventures with Superman. Yeah. yeah. I said something else, didn't I? Yeah, you said Superman and Lois. My bad. We haven't really I seen Perry. Yeah, Superman. we haven't really seen Perry that much in no. Superman and Lois. Beyond the pilot, I was thinking my adventures with Superman and it's okay. the wrong. Thing. It's okay. I've done that. I've done that plenty of times. But anyway, the my adventures with Superman Perry White, where he recognizes their talent, but it's just like completely dumb. I also just like this weird. Well, it's not weird, but this new tradition of just making Perry black. Yeah, because <laughs> it happened in uh, you know, Man of Steel. It happened in my adventures. Uh, and it's happening again with Superman. That's kind of cool. That's cool. Yeah, and it. Go ahead. It, one thing I can say is that some changes are good, but if the character is who they are at their core, mm -hmm. I don't have a problem. That, yeah, I, I think that does. It shouldn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. At least that's my honest opinion. Oh yeah, I mean it really depends, right? Because like, uh, characters like a uh, Kitty Pride or a Ben Grimm, they're racial identity and culture are a big part of their character so like I totally you can't care. you can't really make ben Grimm black or katie pride black or even like hispanic or whatever being jewish is a fundamental part of who they are as characters so those are ones where you can't really change right and what i was mostly getting at is that if there are intrinsic things about that character that keeps them from having a significant change in how the character has been perceived, mm -hmm. that's what I was mostly trying to get at. Oh, like, yeah. A character I like, for example, who is more malleable. Mm -hmm. As long as the main personality of the character is there, then that's fine. They can oh, yeah. be racially ambiguous. Yeah, like it was one of the it was one of the myriad of reasons that Fan Forsick didn't work because they made Sue adopted by uh by the Storms mm -hmm. and like them being like blood siblings is a big part of why the F F is so family oriented because like they're literally family you know three-fourths of them are literally family yeah. and like all um, all they had to do was make sue storm black and this wouldn't have been an issue oh yeah, yeah. but also um on the like the race not being like pertinent for some character i tell you who's one uh person of color that i think could make a really good uh gun uh cat grant okay versus cat grant uh, Tate Gabriel. I've heard that name before. Uh, Prudence from uh, my 
uh, Sabrina Teeny Twitch. Oh, I mean, I mean, yeah, as 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 long as long as she is uh, is a redhead that loves to throw shade and dates exclusively Hispanic men, I uh, I feel like that'll be fine. Because oh, yeah. fun fact about Cat Gray, all all of the love interests she's had besides you know her stint at going after Clark have been Hispanic. Uh, one of her one of her most predominant and well known love interests is uh, the obscure uh, non powered vigilante known as Gangbuster. Oh shit! Oh yeah, Diego Ramirez. I didn't know that were a thing. Mm hmm. They, I remember Gangbuster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cat and Gangbuster were a thing up until the New 52. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. Another bad thing that New 52 did. But what's new? Yep. Anyway, uh, that's it for the Superman news so far. Okay, cool. All right. So far, everything's shaping up rather nicely. Oh, yeah. I'm, for... I'm, very, I'm very excited for this uh, Superman film. Um, especially because, you know, I've, like... You know, I mean, not that I've ever not appreciated Clark as a character, but like I've really turned around on, you know, why oh. Clark is important. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, go ahead. I just, I just remembered one other small tidbit. Okay. That I was gonna mention. Um, somebody asked Gunn on Twitter if Tom, if Tom King had any role in the new movie. Okay. And he said, and he said yes. He was one of the first three people that he gave the script to and asked for notes. Good, good. No. Because like, so you know, I I have been a big critic of Tom King's Batman run, uh, but not in like the hater kind of way. It's all constructive criticism. It's it's not it's not like my whole thing with Bendis. Uh, but like, you know, I've been I've been very critical of his Batman run, but like every time he writes Superman. It's fucking great. Like in the uh, in the lead up to the wedding issue where he uh, where uh, Bruce and Selena go on a double date with Lois Clark. Fantastic. Uh, he actually wrote uh, one of the uh, back when DC was trying to do that whole initiative with original graphic novels sold exclusively at Walmart. Uh, he wrote Superman Up in the Sky, which was amazing. And ironically enough, Bendis wrote the character that he should have gotten when he got to DC, Batman. And it was great. Like, you know, personal beef aside, his Batman story was amazing. Uh, but yeah. So like it's good it's good to hear that King was involved. I hope King is uh, like super involved in uh, Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow because like I hope that DC doesn't just take the Marvel route and just use a title and iconography for recognition's sake. Well, the thing that that gives me hope for it not being that situation is that when we found out that was the name, Gunn himself was talking about how he was such a big fan of the uh comic of the same name oh yeah and it's it, and it's relatively recent i mean shit dc still hasn't given it a, a hardcover trade which is a fucking crime i'm not buying the trade paperback because i know i'm gonna read that so often and it's gonna get fucked up i want a hardcover and uh they've gotten a uh newer director a relative unknown oh that's cool so she'll be more like i don't want to say malleable because that sounds negative yeah but she's she's more uh she'd be more uh, like accepting of like you know adapting the work by actually adapting it yeah, yeah i get you her biggest her biggest thing to date is that she acted in uh the originals huh wow but yeah okay and so having already cast their uh supergirl with uh young uh, uh oh this is gonna be great oh yeah nah Ren yo renera as supergirl is just that's just amazing fucking news i i love i love uh I, I almost said amelia clark i'm like that's daenerys uh fucking millie alcock millie alcock, I, millie yeah, alcock yeah there we go yeah yeah no millie alcock is amazing uh but yeah so that's it for the news and so now it's time to transition into one of my favorite segments screen time screen time is the segment of the podcast where the boys and i discuss all the different pieces of pop culture that we've consumed in between podcast episodes that can range between movies we don't have time to cover tv shows we don't have time to cover or just don't suit the format music 
uh, videos of uh, video rabbit holes we've gone down on YouTube and uh, you know a variety of other things. Uh, so we'll I'll start us off and also we'll kind of make this a, a joint thing with Tony because uh, Tony will finally get to tell you guys kind of like a vacation report as well. Um, so uh, one of the things uh, we managed to do was uh, we went to uh, my my local theater and we saw a performance of Six the Musical at the theater live and it was amazing uh so tony uh before i t before i talk about like what some of my favorite songs are and like some of my favorite characters uh you want to give your uh, quick review of six the musical it was a rather enjoyable experience it felt like i was at a concert that, rather than seeing an actual like, stage performance oh yeah no it definitely felt like a concert essentially it was the six wives of henry the eighth forming a girl band and putting on a concert uh it's it's it was really good the costuming was um, absolutely amazing like you know th these was. these were costumes you could see from the cheap seats and we should know we were in the cheap seats yeah. uh and like the, the lighting was amazing although uh if you do plan on seeing six at uh whenever whenever the show comes to your local area i would highly advise against anyone with epilepsy to go see this show because there are a lot and i mean a lot of flashing strobe lights so mm -hmm. you know you definitely watch out for that um it's really cool because uh you know each uh queen has like specific musical influences in their uh portrayal and you could hear you could hear them a lot like um Anne Boleyn has you know a big Afro Levine type sound. Uh, Catherine Howard is like Ariana Grande. Like it's a lot, it's a lot of cool stuff. Uh, but yeah, Tony. Yeah. So who were some of your favorite characters and favorite songs? Actually, it was rather difficult to peg a uh, a favorite character because all the ladies that performed the uh, each for each of the wives did amazing jobs. Oh yeah, they were fantastic. But I gotta give it to uh just for the sheer showmanship of like throughout the entire show and when she actually performed her songs Anna of Cleves just oh yeah play. Anna she... Anna of Cleves really did kill it you know you could really tell the uh the Mickey uh the Nicki Minaj influence with just the big presence like the the great switch from a singing to like a quick flow and you know just the embrace of her like sexuality like the you know the 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 uh here's my fur as you were uh part where like you know it it, it uh like if you've seen it it's what it was one of those moments where i i was just like okay <laughs> it, this, it, this it's one of these kinds of shows let's go oh it, it definitely came off like that which was absolutely hilarious oh yeah yeah oh and that's but, another that's, yeah. that's another thing the comedy in this show man <laughs> Like, everybody talks about the music, and rightfully so, but this show was really fucking funny. Oh, it was. It most certainly was. Because the overall premise of how this little concert happens, well, in terms of how the characters see it, it's them basically saying to the end, saying to us, who's had the rawest deal of them all? Mm-hmm. And whoever, ha whoever has had to deal with the most BS gets to lead the band. Mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah, no, it, it was it, it's such a really cool premise. Uh, so yeah, Anna Cleves for you. So I'm guessing uh, the the House of Hallberg song was one of, uh, was one of your favorites. Uh, yeah, but mm -hmm. like, musically, I I can't really. I know it's hard. It's I, 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 it, I, I literally spent all day listening to the soundtrack for the fourth time and I'm like, which one? Which one? Dang it! They're all fantastically yeah. well crafted yeah, songs. Yeah, let, let's go. Let's go. Let's go with top three. No particular that, order. Think, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, because I because I, I was only able to narrow it down to three. Yeah, and one of them I think we will be sharing. Okay. So let's get that out of the way. Okay. And that's all I want to do. All I want to do is 100% up there. I loved that song so much. The Ariana Grande influence was absolutely evident. And I am a huge Ari fan. But also, I love, you know, what it depicts in the song. Like, because honestly, like that, that's how a lot of my relationships have, uh, you know, kind of gone through. Like it's, it's one, it's a, it's a song that's very much about like, you know, people, 
people you date only really you know seeing you for you know what you can offer physically as opposed to actually finding a connection and specifically from um specifically from Catherine Howard's perspective uh you know she, she uh, one of the parts of the uh, of the repeated chorus is you know I thought this time would be different or I thought this one would be different different things like that and I'm just like yeah, I've thought that exact same thing every single time. No, I, I fucking vibe with this song for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah and there's another bit of inspiration that is also added because it's not just one person who musically influenced the performances of each of the uh, exes here. There's another secondary yep. musical in and for uh, Catherine Howard in particular, the secondary is Britney Spears. And yep. you could oh yeah too. especially in the performance the performance of all you want to do is very much like slave for you era britney oh and it was fantastic oh yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right so uh what are your other two tony uh, well i gotta give it to uh get down oh yeah yeah oh yeah that's what it was called i kept thinking it was house of hall because like you know that was what was repeated mostly that was more of an ensemble song. Ah, okay. Gotcha. So that's the ensemble that leads into the solo song. Oh, yeah, that makes sense because, yeah, yeah. I'm the queen of the castle. Get down, you dirty rascal. Down. Get down. Yeah. Now I get it. Yeah, no. The the, the Beyonce and Nicki Minaj combo is totally Her there. Was. Hers was Rihanna and Nikki. Oh, Rihanna and Nikki. It, it felt very much more like Beyonce to me, but uh, I could see Riri. I could see Riri in there. Yeah. The Beyonce inspiration was for Catherine of Aragon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nope, nope. That makes sense. It was a very big ballad. It was a very big ballad, and that's one of B's specialties. Yeah, because Catherine of Aragon was... Beyonce Shakira. Beyonce Shakira. Yeah, yeah, Beyonce mm -hmm. Shakira. I remember, I remember that one. Yep, yep, yep. All right, so yeah, yeah. So get down, get down from um, uh, Anna of Cleves. All I want to do from Catherine Howard. Last one. Uh, for me, it would have to be our opener. Ooh, the first. Oh, oh, so the first, uh, the first uh, instance of six. Yeah. So nice. X Live, a perfect uh, I, opener. Oh yeah, and especially how the lighting was used, just. And like, I gotta give it to the uh, the uh, woman on the drums. Like, just uh, just imagine that beat that uh, you know, divorce, beheaded, died. And I I love how like it ends because it goes, you know, now we're divorced, beheaded, live. I was like, oh shit. Yeah, it it's one of those uh, awesome ensemble. Just win an entire group. You you feel that in especially in boy bands. Oh yeah. Of, a certain era and where the, they just love their shit and it's amazing and the core and the choreography for that number is insane so totally totally get where you're coming from and also my favorite thing mm -hmm. it's like a minor minor thing mm -hmm. is when i didn't realize it until i this moment mm -hmm. or the entity of me loving history mm -hmm. as a history nut yeah make this because of until now he henry the eighth divorced twice killed the two exes one died and the last one before his death lived to see another day mm -hmm. which it and then put musically is divorce beheaded died do -do 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 -do. Divorce, divorced beheaded, beheaded survived do -do -do. Dun, dun, dun. Oh my! Yeah, no, it's it, it's great. It's the horror than that. It's the oh yeah, that. no, no, it, 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 it it's 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 a it's a very powerful opener. And uh, you know, I really um, you know, uh, just to, to piggyback off of that, I you know, as someone else who really enjoys history, uh, in particular, I do find the uh, like the backstory and like you know, deal of the uh British. Uh, monarchical uh, lineage to be really fascinating, mostly just because of the pettiness back and forth between siblings and disputes over line of succession and, you know, all this other stuff. And so to see that, like, you know, portrayed in this show as, like, you know, a bunch of catty divas at first, which it made perfect sense. Like, it didn't stretch the concept because if you look at any of the, uh, you know, ancient British aristocracy, and I'll say ancient, but I mean, you know, a few hundred years ago, uh, they're all just a bunch of catty divas. 
Like, so it's pretty accurate. Uh, and some of them had goals. Well, I say all of them have some goal and ambition. Yeah. To throughout their life. It may not be as evident, but there was some things can be counted as a goal. And the and the modern references didn't really bother me or phase me because like, you know, it's how you connect with the audience. I, I feel like, you know, if they were using old English the entire time, half of the half of the crowd would just be like, what the fuck are they saying? You know, not yeah, it, not everybody's a fucking Shakespeare nut. Like, I mean, I would have enjoyed it, but like I would have enjoyed it too. Yeah. Yeah, but it gives me vibes of uh whatchamacallit. What was that show called? Rain? Dickinson. Oh Dickinson. Yeah, yeah, no, it, yeah, it definitely has some very similar vibes to Dickinson. Uh so going to my other two uh like top songs from six, uh, you know, like Tony said, all I wanna do is one for me. Uh I absolutely pun intended love the song I Don't Need Your Love. That it's amazing and i love that message because it first starts out as you know this heartfelt letter or she has to you know confess uh she has to confess to her lover who you know she was planning a future with and was about to marry finally but then you know the king says he wants to marry her and so you can't really say no to the king unless you want to die so and especially because he has a reputation of killing women who <laughs> disagree with him so you know she did it anyway so it starts off with this like melancholic like you know even though it's not true i have to tell you i don't need your love um and it's just you can really feel the pain in that part and i love it but then like in the second half of the song she you know stands up and is like oh no you i'm not some toy for you to play with henry i don't need your love no no like that shit is that, that was awesome that was fucking awesome that's it's such a good like breakup song kind of like in both senses of the word it's one it's a sad breakup song and also a fuck you breakup song at the same time and i loved that and that's that's the song performed by uh catherine parr which is yep been, yeah and that Ka is Mm -hmm. That was some Alicia Keys, which is her like musical inspiration. It yep. sounds very much like yeah, yeah. something Alicia for sure. Yeah, and Catherine Parr is one of my personal favorite characters of the show because you know a big through line throughout with uh with Parr was like you know why the fuck are we doing this? Why the fuck are we competing? Like, you know, and she even like drops out of the competition like during the song and she questions like, but why is that the thing I have to sing about? You know, you know, I was a writer. I fought for women's education. I, I even, you know, got a female painter to paint my portrait. Why does nobody remember me for that? Like, you know, so that was really cool. That was really cool. Um, And obviously, well, obvious to these gentlemen, but like, if you know me at all, my favorite, well, what one of my other favorite songs is uh, Don't Lose Your Head. Uh, That was performed by Anne Boleyn. It's, it's so catchy and like bubblegum. It's a mix of like bubblegum and pop punk, which, you know, you could tell from like the Avril Lavigne inspiration that she takes from. And it, it it's just a really fun song just and the chorus just gets stuck in your head forever i, I even bought a t-shirt with the chorus on it uh well part of the chorus it, it it was just it was a great it was a great time i i really i really enjoyed it um but moving on to some shared content uh like homie hang stuff uh we watched a few things together uh we watched aquaman the lost kingdom on uh, max it was a good film it wasn't as fun as the first one but like you know it was still enjoyable it was better than what people were saying but still not master class yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the like, the effects are really good i really did like the uh brother you know the brotherly relationship between arthur and orm yep that mm -hmm. was great that was like the whole crux of the movie oh yeah yeah and like for the most part all the jokes landed mm-hmm um you know yeah so yeah the plot was kind of uh flimsy by numbers yeah a little flimsy but you know 
it's the last DCEU movie. I don't think, uh, like, I can understand from James Bond's perspective, and I don't think this is how he approached it, but I could understand you being like, well, if this is the last one, why do I even, you know, why do I even bother to try something new and different? Because it's not like they're going to give me a sequel. This is the last one. Yeah, and uh, in that same vein, though, I'm pretty sure he knew when uh, he filmed the uh, post-credits. Yep. Because post-credits wasn't teasing anything. It was just... It was it was almost it was almost a parody of the post credit scene from the first Avengers movie. Yep. Kinda. But with like a gross element to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um but yeah, overall that was a good that was a good movie. We we enjoyed it. Uh Brian and I watched uh Tick Tick Boom, the Andrew uh, oh. Andrew Garfield musical movie uh, about the life of one John Larson, the uh, writer and creator of Rent, as well as the uh, unfinished and unreleased um, musical uh, Superbia. And the uh, namesake, Tick, Tick, Boom. And Tick, Tick, Boom as well. But yeah, the one man live stage, uh, you know, the one man live stage show, Tick, Tick, Boom. Um, but yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, I'll let you have the floor with this one, Brian, because, you know, I've seen this a million times. <laughs> it definitely lived up to the hype, but also it was a big existential crisis, uh, one-two punch. Huh? Yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> uh, yep. Andrew Garfield was great. Vanessa Hudgens had a smaller role than I thought when I heard people talk about the movie, but she was still great for what she was. I mean, her role is pretty substantial from a music standpoint. I think people, you know, just wanted her to be like more like have more acting involved. But like, you know, yeah, regardless, she was great. <laughs> yep. And, uh. God, I'm blanking on her name. The girlfriend, she was great. Oh yeah, yeah, the girl, the girl that played Susan. Yep. And she also played Storm in Apocalypse. Yep. Yeah. No, she was great. I loved the uh, loved the kind of duet between with her and Vanessa Hudgens, like switching back and forth for "Come to Your Senses." That was amazing. And the great cinematography. One scene in particular, I thought Jay was like overhyping, but but you weren't. Yeah. That's right. The the uh, pool musical note scene. Yeah, that look, that shit is fucking beautiful. Yep, and it does hit you like uh, cuz sometimes if you're like in the shower or something, it's just like inspiration will hit you then and you're like holy shit. Every every song I've ever written has been written in the shower. At the very least, partially written in the shower. Like, I've written... Every chorus I've written to a song has been written in the shower, for sure. This, uh, maybe, uh, thing that I might really someday, um, the opening, I completely came up with it in the shower, and I think I was still partially wet when I was typing it on my computer, because I was like, I need to get this out before I forget it. Oh yeah, no, nah, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the thing. But yeah, no, nah, it was it's a it's a great movie. Uh, you know, honoring a great creator, um, mm -hmm. especially you know to for modern theater history, right? You know, and yeah, either, and so, also, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say, also gives you like several great like hard hitting questions and uh, thoughts about life. Also, like, you know, if you are a Broadway nerd, a theater nerd, musical nerd, like, mm -hmm. this is Legend Cameo City. Mm -hmm. Like, holy crap. That fucking, the Moondance Diner is just where all the Broadway legends were just, just chilling, hanging out. Not even just Broadway legends, but even some other legends. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that was great. And then, uh. You had a Bradley Whitford come in as the man, the myth, the legend himself. Yeah, Stephen Sondheim, one of my one of my personal favorite writers and composers for theater. Actually, uh, one of the direct mentors of Howard Ashman, who you you guys may know from creating some of your favorite Disney classics. Who unfortunately passed of HIV, uh, be right before the premiere of Beauty and the Beast. Ooh. Which was his last, uh, which it was his last work that, uh, like he, uh, like he was able to, like, be there the whole way through. Luckily, he had already written a, lo a lot of the stuff for Lion King, including the, um, including, like, helping Sir Elton John on, uh, Can You Feel the Love? Mm. So, you know, huge contribution. Like, and, so and Sondheim is no slouch in his own right. I mean, he has Into the Woods, West Side Story, and a million others that I could name, but, you know, we don't want to be here all day. No. 
but it was great lived up to the hype definitely recommend it uh especially if you like are an aspiring anything in the entertainment world oh yeah for sure um also uh mm -hmm. just a quick shout out also to the actor who played the best friend oh yeah yeah no, he, he was great he was great uh, uh what what else is there shared wise oh we also checked out a uh anime based on a manhwa that's on netflix it's called Luxem. uh it's it's a it's a really interesting concept that i don't want to spoil because if i give away the concept it'll like you know mess mess with the twist factor but it's very good so far we've only watched two episodes but i, I really enjoy it the opening is a banger animation is great mm -hmm. i will admit that it also is a bit of a heavy hitter and can be uncomfortable to watch at times. Yeah, all the, yeah, but you know, it all it all depends. Viewer just you know, watch at your own discretion. Yeah, I'm just warning people. No, I get it. Because I did I didn't know. Y'all were just like, hey, new anime David recommended that we've already watched some of. Well, we only watched like five minutes, so wasn't wasn't crazy it wasn't like a crazy amount we didn't go through like half an episode and then you came in uh but yeah well, i didn't know what what do you mean we told you we told you that we watched the first uh, just the first five minutes you didn't say the first five minutes you said we've watched some i'm pretty sure i said the first five minutes but whatever but anyway, uh, uh, anyway and we did our we did our what we try to be weekly but sometimes is not watches of uh delicious and dungeon and feud yep we, we caught back up on feud great mm-hmm Lo but love all the shade. We'll be talking about that. Mm -hmm. later. Oh, yeah. Oh, also, we checked out the premiere of Shogun, which was amazing. It oh, was the, the first two episodes. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. That is also going to be a show. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, oh, be an episode, I meant. Mm -hmm. There's another thing that uh, Jay and I should probably mention. Oh. We checked out the first in an ongoing series that's tangentially connected to my Crusader Kings 3 A Game of Thrones mod rabbit hole that I normally go on. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, Jay, yeah. Mm -hmm. please, uh, we caught the first episode of The Bastard's Rebellion, yep. a collection of different stories starting with a bastard son of the House of Tower. Yep, House Bull Tower, and yeah, it's it's really fucking interesting. I mean, Tony's already showed me some of these, but it was cool. It was cool to get on uh, in on the ground floor of one. Uh, I'm definitely gonna be following it for sure. Yep, and just to see this big beefy ginger man cut a swath to claim his, in his mind, inherited birthright through force is yeah a kind of story. Oh yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. Um, other stuff. Uh, I recently, like literally just before this recording, uh, watched a video by Princess Weeks, one of my pers one of my personal favorite, like I guess pop culture analyses, uh, an analyst. Um, and her her video her video was like an hour an hour and a half long video about the uh Twilight hate isn't just misogyny where she broke down a lot of the uh valid criticisms and problems with twilight uh how uh it perpetuates a lot of sexist stereotypes how it is very very overtly racist um and uh just just all and just all around like you know kind of mediocre and I, I know i know what you're probably thinking listeners uh duh it's fucking twilight but also it's it's one of those things where it's like you have to also consider that where a lot of the hate from twilight uh you know does come from some uh co does come from you know accurate and valid criticism but also a lot of it comes from oh yeah this is a book for girls women and moms of course it's stupid so like you know that's that's not okay that's not okay at all uh but it was a very interesting interesting deep dive she actually printed out like direct pages of the book to reference when she was uh, you know talking about examples of you know sexism racism and such like the fact that like the cullens literally give jacob a dog bowl when he stays with them in uh breaking dawn uh the the fact that 
you know, Victoria's whole, not Victoria, what, uh, Rosalie's whole motivation for disliking Bella in the first place is because, well, not only is Bella human and, you know, Rosalie's jealous of that, but she's somehow jealous of the fact that Edward shows her, even though she's happily married, uh, with Emmett, and, like, they, they fuck so much that they ruin houses, like, I got... I, you know, I never understood it. She never understood it. I don't think anybody ever understood it. Uh, nah. But like, you know, how all of, all of the, like, all of the female characters are written uh, with goals around, like, this sexist, idealized version of motherhood and womanhood, and how Meyer personally sees, like, Twilight as a feminist book because it, uh, you know, in it, her main heroine is allowed choices, but, like, you know, th th it's, there's a double-edged sword with that. It, she goes into more detail. Watch her video. Uh, it's it's great. Uh, but, nice. yeah. Does she go into, like, the, uh, the unintentional, latent, um, like, um, what's the best way to say this? Uh, like, lesbian vibes? No. I mean, like, uh, like, one, one, one of the, one, exactly. yeah, one, one of, one of the, one of the big things she points out with Alice actually is that like Alice, everybody complains about how vain and shallow Roslyn is, but actually Alice is just as vain and shallow when you look at it. Cause like all she really does is talk about, all she ever talks about with Bella is fixing up Bella, you know, dressing her up, planning parties. And she talks, you know, about her cars and her material possessions. Also, she's married to a former Confederate soldier. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's not a good look. I, I like, I liked Alice a lot when I read Twilight, but that was because it wasn't because of Alice from the books. It was because of Ashley Green in the movies. Uh, like yeah. as bad as the Twilight movies are, like they actually add much more dimension to the characters than the actual book mm. does. So, you know, there's that. But yeah, it was a great video. To totally recommend if you're interested in that kind of thing to watch it. I'll I'll leave it. I'll link it to you after a recording, Brian. I think you I think you would enjoy it. Cool. Um, that's pretty much. Oh, uh, I also uh recently read the second issue of a mini series that I've been following over at Marvel called Avengers Twilight. It's essentially a post apoc no, well not post apocalyptic. It's an it's the Avengers in an Orwellian society akin to 1984. Uh, so essentially. Uh, there was an incident where Ultron managed to uh, use nanomachines to uh, like hack the brain of the Hulk and uh, and control the Hulk and uh, to cause rampant chaos. It, it was an incident known as H Day, where Hulk tore through the city and most of the country and killed hundreds of thousands of people. Ooh. So you know the world really turned on the Avengers and superheroes at that point. Uh, it eventually became dominated by corporations, um, you know, and one of which being Stark Industries, which is run by James Stark, the son of Tony Stark and Janet Van Dyne. Huh. He's a real piece of shit. <laughs> I mean, real piece of shit. Like he like he's intelligent, but he's nowhere near as intelligent as Tony. So what he does is. Tony survived H day barely. Like, you know, he's like half of a body. Mm. Uh, but he, you know, his brain is still functional. And James literally has him hooked up to a tank so he can download information from his dad and use his dad's vast intellect and knowledge to continue to ma manufacture Iron Man suits for the government and, you know, other various things. Yeah. James is a piece of shit. So uh, on the other end of that, Captain uh, Steve, Captain America, uh, is kind of is very disconnected from the world. He doesn't really know what's going on. He just kind of thinks, all right, you know, the the world's done with us. But you no, know, it was bound to happen eventually. You know, he go he goes. He lives he lives his own life. He ends up having a wife and you know and, and just a you know cushy life, uh, military pension and all that. And then eventually, like he like he go. Like he goes out into the world and he's like, what the fuck? Why, why are these cops beating up these little kids who are just skateboarding just because it's a little pat curfew? That, that's not right. What the hell? And so eventually he ends up meeting up with uh, old man Luke Cage, who is nowhere near as strong as he used to be. Because the interesting thing is uh, 
as he got older, his bulletproof skin continued to harden to the point where it is difficult for him to move now. Mm. Uh, so, but Luke uh, is the advisor to this underground resistance of uh, heroes uh, called the Defenders. And basically, they get Cap back into a recreation of Dr. Erskine's machine to give him back the super soldier serum because eventually, you know, over time, it just burned out of his system. Um, so he he's back to being Captain America again, de uh, dealing with all this crazy bullshit. Um, and like one of my favorite moments in the second issue is how the second issue ends because like he's he's fighting against james like he had just broken into the raft to uh try and you know get tony tony's body out of there so that you know they could possibly you know put tony in like a life support iron man suit so he could be active again and you know do his thing but uh he's fighting james and you know it looks like james has the upper hand he shoots down the quinjet that he that um that his um, one of his teammates, Tyler, who is a computer specialist and a uh, current member of the Thunderbolts Bullseye, who overheard James conversation talking about like how he and many others have manipulated the country and the people. And she decided, nah, fuck this. I'll, I'll work with Captain America. And she's actually and Cap even calls it out. Uh, this new Bullseye uses an air, uh, bow and arrow and, and he go and, you know, Steve goes, you know, you call yourself Bullseye, but I know a Hawkeye when I see one. Uh, right. So, you know, th that was cool. But but the best the best part is right. Like when all hope seems to be lost and you think Steve is about to get got by this bitch ass kid in an Iron Man suit, a shittier Iron Man suit, mind you, because he made that one by himself. But, you know, he's about to get got and all of a sudden, you know, he, lightning comes down and then and James is like, Uncle Steve, what did you do? And then Steve is like, I do what I, I do, what I always do when times are hard, son. I prayed. Thor shows up and he goes, it's been a wolf's age, Captain. Shall we assemble? And I'm like, yo, yo, it's Thor. <laughs> The king of like Deus Ex Machina, bro, bro. It was it, it was it was so hype because you know um nice. after H Day Thor got disillusioned with Midgard because he saw how corrupt Midgard was getting after after that whole thing. So he fucked off to Asgard. But like man, just to just to hear just to see him just fucking superhero land and just obliterate James Stark was amazing. <laughs> And just the line of, you know, it's been a wolf age, Captain, shall we assemble, was, oh my god, man. Nice. Shit is Moment. so, shit is so high. I, I'm really enjoying this story in particular. Um, uh, you know, it, it's one of the few Marvel things that I've been enjoying that's not X-Men related. Um, it's very good. Totally, uh, totally check it out if you're a, you know, a big Avengers uh, fan. Mm -hmm. It's a question. <laughs> Yeah. You can go first, Brian. Okay, I was just going to say a quick question. Uh-huh. Uh, who is Bullseye slash Hawkeye? Is she an OC? We don't know. We don't. Uh, she hasn't revealed her name yet, so we don't know. I just know she's a she's a blonde chick who uses a bow and arrow. Okay. Oh. That also happens okay. to that also happens to be purple. So, you know, it could mean a lot of things. Yep. But in the grand scheme of things, this seems like an Avenger story that's up my alley. Oh, yeah. It it reminds me a lot of like uh next avengers but without actually following the the children of the avengers it's it's like one of those classic you know uh you know the hero comes out of retirement to save the day again kind of thing and it really kind of focuses on it's like it's like the Avengers equivalent to whatever happened to truth, justice in the American way. Mm. But it's like taken a step further with this whole, you know, dystopian Orwellian future. Nice. Very good read. I cannot wait to finish this. And once it wraps up, I'm totally getting straight. Oh, that uh, sounds absolutely nice. great. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, Brian, I, I've, uh, I've finished up my surprisingly long ass list. What you got for us? All right, um, just uh, three quick things um, that I watched without the guys. Um, one is um, just uh, continuing to watch uh, Game Changer, uh, the dropout show. Mm -hmm. This one, like I said before, each episode is a different like game show type thing. Mm -hmm. This one was the newly web game. Mm -hmm. This is what they called it. Okay. They brought in three couples in three separate stages of... Uh, 
their relationship. One serious dating, one engaged, and one very newly married. Oh. And, uh, what they did was before the game started, they uh, surrendered their phones. And the producers went through their phones and asked the partner questions based on what was in their phone. Like, one was, what are their top three most used apps? What is in their search bar? Like, out of this list, which one belongs to your partner? How many selfies do they have? And uh, how many secret photos do they have? Oh, man. Just an interesting time. Oh, yeah. Nice no, sound. It. Uh, one of the guys there, part of the dating crew, his name is uh, Ify Nuwadwe. Mm -hmm. And if you've never heard of him, I think you would vibe with him, Jay. He is a, he is a huge nerd who's also a ladies' man. And uh, also um, like sports. Um, he's also the new host of um, actually their uh, Nerdcred uh, game show. Oh, cool! But anyway, moving on. After we watched like Tick Tick Boom, and uh, we did a whole thing of uh, deep dive into Hasbro Hotels Poison. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted something that I was thinking would be a uh, comedy. So I pulled up on Netflix to see any comedies, and there's one that I have uh, been meaning to watch that I pulled up and actually watched. It's <laughs> called uh, Do Revenge. I haven't heard of this one. I think we did the trailer way back in the day. Uh, this one is the one where it stars uh, Maya Hawk and Camila Mendes. Mm. It's Yeah, we did do the trailer. Yeah, I just never watched it. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, but these two teenage girls who meet up, and uh, since the world doesn't really know that they know each other, they agree to do revenge for each other on their enemies, and hijinks ensue. It roll like you know, mess, a lot of mess. Um, it's actually got um a lot of like teen com teen teen uh like content alums. Like uh, I said, which is funny because most of them are no longer teenagers. Yeah, Camila Mendez, Maya Hawk, Austin Abrams. Oh shit! Who uh, you might know from it's not a teen thing, but this is us. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Gloria. Yeah, Ethan. Dash and Lily. Mm -hmm. uh, Talia Ryder, who uh, uh, she was a key player in the season of Love Victor that we didn't watch. Oh. I I hear that uh, she might have been like a love interest for for our girl. Oh, like, really? Huh. Maybe, but also Sophie Turner. What? What the fuck oh? is? What the fuck was Sansa doing over there? She plays a smaller role, but it is one of the funniest roles I have ever seen her. I mean, I I've seen her in interviews. She's fucking hilarious. And then also, um, Alicia Bowie or Bo, uh, Jessica in uh, Thirteen Reasons Why. Oh, cool. I, I liked her. But this was really good. It. Did a lot of harking back to uh to like classic teen comedies of like the eighties, nineties, early two thousands. Had even a little bit of uh Heathers in there. Would you say it's a uh, fetch? Yeah. All right. Look at that, folks. They said we couldn't make it happen. We made it happen. Ha. But but uh -huh. uh, oh shit! I did not realize this. Huh? No. It the director. Mm -hmm. is a jennifer caitlin robinson okay and mm. on her wikipedia it says best known first thing creator of sweet vicious oh shit <laughs> oh i'm glad she found something else she was fantastic sweet vicious was fantastic and she was a real sweetheart uh when i covered the finale and like you know gave this whole impassioned speech about how important this show is and how i you know really want this to be renewed she actually she commented a whole ass paragraph like thanking me and you know for showing support and you know covering each episode of the show she's a, she's really nice nice as far as movies, as far as movies go, she's only directed this and one other movie. Mm -hmm. It's a, another Netflix, it's a Netflix rom-com. Because Do Revenge is not really a rom-com, it's more of like a dark comedy. Mm -hmm. With some romance in it. Mm -hmm. But uh, she also did a rom-com for, another rom-com for Netflix um, called uh, Something Great. Ah, this one had cool. Gina Rodriguez, Brittany Snow, and Dewanda Wise. Man, and man. The notable thing about this movie is that she actively admitted that uh, while writing this movie, because she also wrote it, mm -hmm. 
that uh, she was listening to uh, one specific album over and over and over and over again and took it as like inspiration. What album? That album being a favorite of the show, 1989. Oh, nice. Wait, is Something Great the one with Gina Rodriguez and Lakeith Stanfield? Yes. I loved that movie. I, wa I, uh, I watched that with Ellie for one of the uh, one of our date nights. Yeah. But yeah, that, that, was a... that movie was somewhat inspired by 1989. I could see it. Actually, I think they include, like, Welcome to New York in it. Yeah. Um, or New Year's Eve. And also, uh, Do Revenge does actively quote Taylor. Oh, cool. Which, it's nice to see some... It's nice to see a movie that does a joke involving Taylor, but it's not making fun of her or slut-shaming her. Yep, yep, yep. But anyway, I watched that movie, and then the last thing is just a podcast that I want to shout out. It's uh, It was formerly called uh, Romania 500. Now, it's called Too Many Taps. It is a, the whole entire podcast is a husband and wife duo podcast, I think I've talked about it before, where uh, they take turns lore dumping on the other. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they came back with a new season of the show after recovering from having a baby. And uh, they've changed the name, changed, like, rebranded some. But it's still the same like, content. Mm -hmm. And their first topic is the wife telling the husband about Patrick Nagel. Huh. Which, uh, you don't know who that is. That is an artist who appeared in, like, the late 80s, early 90s, around the same time as, like, David Copperfield. Um, hmm. He, if you go to, like... A, uh, your generic barber shops or beauty shops and you see those like monotone like drawing type looking art that's him but i won't spoil it but the story around him is crazy interesting uh it's a good like look up if you want to look up or listen to the podcast to find out like all the crazy stuff about him it also involves um a lawsuit with playboy huh. so cool but uh, i'll end it there since we've been going on for so long oh well one last thing that i forgot to mention uh is uh my boy jordan uh actually shared with me a really interesting video uh, of a uh, of a woman explaining uh or not explaining but like giving tips for uh like playing d uh playing D, D with adhd and like they're both tips for players and tips for game masters to accommodate for players who have adhd really really good stuff really good stuff it's a very well-made video and a lot of it is very accurate and she also differentiates she's you know my symptoms are different from yours so you know this might not work for you but if you display some of these symptoms then you could try this out adjust it however you need to like you know she talks she talks about fidgeting uh restlessness uh the in the inability to retain spells and effects because it's too fucking much information to store in your your massive fucking head uh, mm -hmm. he doesn't say that exactly but th that's what it is and that's how it feels uh and uh funny thing is she mentioned that she's like you know i don't really pl i've played every kind of class i've played every class and every kind of character but whenever i uh, you know, whenever I want to play a caster, I either play cleric or bard because they're a type of caster that has a set spell list as as opposed to your wizard, your wizards, your, you know, warlocks and different things like that. That, you know, oh, yeah. you have to constantly remember your prepared uh, spells you have to prepare and stuff. Which, that's weird because clerics, you, clerics, you have to do that too. I mean, yeah. But like it's pro it's probably, probably a sm less yeah I was gonna say it's probably a smaller list uh but yeah it is so it's uh, it's a uh, so that was very interesting and uh, personally helpful to me uh so because yeah, um and I'm glad to see that Jordan was the one who shared that with you because I hope we can get his game off oh yeah yeah for sure because he ba he uh, yeah he basically sent it to me and be like all right so watch this on your own time tell me how accurate it is and you know if there's anything that you would personally want to try and implement and stuff and you know we talked over some things and you know we even came up with the idea of like creating a document where level by level we just uh you know we write down you know what spells i have access to and ideal scenarios to use them in because that's another problem i have that you know she even mentioned is a, a pretty common problem with uh players with adhd is not remembering the optimal like cast scenarios for an effect to work properly um 
she she even mentioned something that made me feel way less stupid that like the fr uh, the first time she uh played a barbarian she constantly forgot to rage <laughs> and i was like finally it's not just me uh but yeah it was a great video so yeah that's it for screen time uh so now we're jumping uh, into tony. oh i mean tony tony's and mine were kind of shared because we uh, uh tony did you watch anything on your own oh no uh-oh uh-oh tony? tony hey buddy you with us yeah uh Okay. Okay. We we thought that we thought you fell asleep again. Uh, Brian, Brian was asking if you watched anything on your own. Other than uh, two in-flight movies while I was heading to Virginia for my trip. Something that I rewatched a few years back, and something I just watched for the first time. Mm -hmm. I'll start with the thing that I uh, rewatched. It was It 2017. Man, Ooh. fucking terrifying. I still get to watch the sequel. Oh, you haven't seen part two? Oh, no. shit. It's on Max. Oh, we got to do that. Oh, definitely. That is a C for the Homie Cube. And so is uh, Do Revenge, by the way, because it was great. All right, cool. Okay, cool, cool. And also, something that I told Jay about, but now that makes two people who saw this film in this uh, three-man team, that is Elemental. Yeah. Hi. It's actually a well done animated film. It's very cute. I, I don't know why it didn't get more press. Like, I only heard about it for real. I mean, I saw a couple commercials, but I only really heard about it when it came to Disney Plus. It was a very, yeah, it was a very cute movie. Very interesting original concept. Like, you know, people complain that animation, you know, d or, or movies in general don't really use, like, you know, unique ideas anymore this one did but nobody talked about it it's the uh the duality of film yep is films that take the most risks don't get enough screen time but the things that get enough screen time is studio produced to convenience store fast food levels of production yep and well at least this time it did get screen time <laughs> this <laughs> da -da -da. but this was also uh i believe this was during the time where uh where uh Iger stepped down and uh, Fuckface took over for a bit. Yep, yep, yep. Who didn't know what the fuck he was doing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it was also one, I think it was also a pandemic movie. Yeah. Along mm -hmm. with uh, that one movie that they put out, uh, the the one where it was like Swiss Family Robinson, but uh, also... New World. There you go. There it is. Where it was just called Strange World. Yep. Oh. Yeah, which I've heard good things about from people who've watched it, but like, you know, nobody's nobody's watched it. Also, nobody talked about Soul either, and Soul was fantastic. Soul was phenomenal. Um, and also uh, around that time also was the underrated, it wasn't fantastic, but it was still underrated, uh, Onward. Oh yeah, Onward was good. Onward was solid. Um, also, no one really talked about Luca. Luca is, is a very good film as well. Yeah. Super gay. Super gay. You can't tell. You can't tell me those fish boys weren't in love. Like. Well, also, um, apparently, uh, so is uh, Strange World. Huh. Nice. Like it's canonical, not just implied. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, I, rem I remember like there was a there's a whole to do about the fact that like there were there were the a gay couple in Strange World and you know how they're forcing oh. their agenda into you know into our Disney. That was a uh, well, no. onward. Oh, was it onward? I know that they. Yeah. I know no. that they, I know. Strange. Okay. It was Strange World. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't. World did a cutesy little romance between the son and a new character. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I was going to say, Onward didn't have any gay relationships but, uh, in it. It did. There was that uh, one cop talking about her wife and her kid. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep, yeah. And then, so, yeah, like, and then people also, like, threw a bitch fit over Lightyear. Home, uh, her, uh, the commander having, you know, having a girlfriend and eventual wife. Yeah, but yeah. people also... Also threw a fit at a at a I think it was across the Spider Verse mm -hmm. because uh, if you pause it at a certain time, you can see that Gwen has a trans rights uh, poster. Ah, mm -hmm. but yeah. So that was screen time. Now let's jump into trailer talk. Trailer talk is the segment of the podcast where our boy Brian here has gathered up six, count them six, 
new trailers for us to react to, at least new of the as of the time of this recording. Uh, so we are going to go ahead and check those out. You can find the playlist down in the description below and oh, YouTube people at least. And then we will come back via the magic of editing and give you guys our rapid fire thoughts. Until then, please enjoy this word from our non-existent sponsors. And we're back. Okay, another solid batch of trailers. One that I hated, not because it was bad, but because like that series in particular terrifies me. Uh, and there was one because it was cringy. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. yeah. I think that one was by far the weakest because of its cringe power levels. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, like, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and talk about that one. Uh, Davy Jones Locker. Uh, it has a cool premise, but it feels like it's trying too hard to be everything, everywhere, all at once, but a teen comedy. Well, I know exactly what it's trying to be. Hmm. It's trying to be a modern Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. You know what? That's a that's a better analogy. Yeah. That's a better analogy. It's a well, it's a mix of both of them. Yeah, it's a yes. it's a modern inter it's a modern fusion of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure with everything everywhere all at once, but with a female duo instead of a male one. Yeah, no, that that's pretty accurate. Well, also, it does seem like might we be reaching? You can let me know. But it seemed like they were trying to to like go for the quote unquote woke audience without like knowing what it is like it not it um. it, it feels like it feels like it, this was written by people who want to appeal to the like progressive crowd yeah. without yeah. actually being progressive like they just look up buzzwords and yeah. just That's a better way of what i was yeah and yeah and just throw them in there like i definitely think so yeah. Yeah, so that was a dud. Uh, Strangers was a very good trailer. Uh, like, uh, beautifully shot, masterfully done. Yeah, but uh, and, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Madeline Pestich. Price? Pestich. Oh, Pestich. Nice to see her do stuff. Yeah, instead of just being weird ass, crazy ass Cheryl with her, like going from Hawkeye to the Scarlet Witch. Yeah, mm. and she she actually does make a really good screen queen. Oh yeah, no, definitely. But uh, I, yeah, she, 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 she oh yeah, she was definitely built for it. Um, but yeah, strangers terrifies me, so I'm gonna skip that entirely. I'll watch that check out for myself, cause as a fan of horror, I always try to give. Yeah. I'm a fan. Of, horror I'm a movie. I'm a fan of horror as well, but home invasion horror is way too real. I I I I I, I, I like horror. I like horror that I know is fake, so I don't have to worry about that shit you know, popping up, except for the ghost stuff. The ghost stuff, I believe, is real. But, like, you know, slashers and all that shit, you know, that that's totally, you know, in the realm of fantasy. So, like, I, I, could, I could deal with those. And, you know, you're out there supernatural horrors, but home invasion horror, that could happen to anybody. Like, it's... it's part of the horror. I know! I I that's get, what I'm. I, I get your uh, hesitation, but I am. Oh yeah. I, yeah oh yeah. I'm not talking y'all. I'm not talking y'all out of it. I'm just explaining my personal fear. Like Jordan put. Yeah. Jo Fine. Like Jordan put it best. It, it it's they're super scary because it's like you know you you don't ever you don't ever you know you're never putting yourself in the situation of like a you know a final girl or you know another horror protagonist. But like when you're watching one of those, you're like, wait, what? I'm at home. Yeah. Oh shit! Um, yeah. Also, there is like a bit of uh, don't want to get into it too much, but uh, there is an obvious difference between Tony and I and Jay. Yeah, and I mean, like, all, also, like, uh, even stuff like Don't Breathe or Hush, those were home invasion-y, but also they had some, like, certain unrealistic elements to it that, you know, let me know that it wasn't a real thing. Well, Hush, it's a completely different person. Also, she's just like this one out in the middle of the woods. Like, who the fuck would do that? Yeah, that's, um, what, that's what I'm saying. But uh, back to The Strangers, though. Yeah, I love the original. Uh, still one of the like best horror scenes of all time is the one where it's uh, Liv Tyler, I believe it was. Yep. Um, is on the phone talking to somebody and... Just in the background, you see one of them walking. Yep. I remember that. But anyway, that trailer looks good. Uh, we told you who would watch it and who would. Um, yep. 
Iron Rain. Uh, Iron Iron Rain looks dope as hell. Mm -hmm. That uh, it was a fucking like Spanish drug cartel drama with a uh, you know moles, twists and turns, enough bricks to build a fucking house. Mm -hmm. Like so many bricks of cocaine, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, Snowflame would be in paradise. Oh yeah, Snowflame, um, Charlie Sheen, Richard Pryor. Which, by the way, did you know they brought him back for the new Fifty Two? Really? Yes, huh. that they did. That's hilarious. Yeah. He was a uh, he was a Catwoman villain. That's hilarious. Huh. That is funny. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, it's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. We'll do it later. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, indeed. And uh, the tattooist of Alshul. That looks super interesting. I've mm -hmm. all I've always liked uh like the Holocaust survivor perspective type stuff. Like uh the boy in the striped pajamas. Um, kind well, it's not exactly the same thing, but Jojo Rabbit had a kind of like similar thing to it. Also, that upcoming uh, Joey King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I'm surprised. You know what I'm surprised they haven't done like a modern take on. Hmm. Like they haven't turned this into a mini series or something. Like a like a prestige mini series. The Diary of Anne Frank. Huh. Hmm. Yeah. Right yeah, like it's it like it's one it's one of the most quintessential like Holocaust survival stories that everybody knows because you know you read it in school. Um. Yeah. And like uh my uh. My sister and my grandma have been to the Anne Frank house. It looks, it looks, it looks so cool. Nice. But one story that we don't really get told about mm -hmm. is about like the actual tattooists who are responsible for maiming the Jewish people. Oh, oh yeah, like you know, and uh, like the fucked up part is like you know they weren't all you know Germans. Most of them were just Jewish people who were forced to do these jobs, and you know if they continued to do these jobs. They'd be useful, so they wouldn't be thrown into the ovens or the gas chambers. Like yeah. also, uh, mm -hmm. that blonde that was in there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's um, I forgot her name now, but uh, homegirl from um, Castle Rock and uh, Last of Us. Oh, the the one, the one, the one, the one who played uh, fuck, I why can't I remember her name right now? Uh, Joel's girlfriend. No. Oh. Uh, the like quote unquote resistance leader. Oh, she was she was the she was the leader of the group that like Sam like that Sam and Henry were yeah. a part of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mhm, mm mhm, mm mhm. Mm Not shutting them down. Yep, yep, yep. Mhm. Mm her. Yeah, I believe her name was like Marlene or some shit. Mhm. Mm yeah. Yep. But uh, in a brighter note though, Little Wing. Little Wing looks fun. Uh, it's in it's set in Tony's favorite city of all time. <laughs> portland uh, and uh yeah it's, it's a really interesting premise like uh, uh you know it really does capture the um like um i, for, I forget the i forget the name of the actual syndrome but it's uh not main character syndrome but it's it's the it's the phenomena where a lot of teenagers like kind of see uh, see themselves as the center of the world egocentrism egocentrism there it is uh i found it uh thanks brain um but yeah it really showcases the egocentrism of you know kids at that time because like you know it clearly shows that uh the uh main lead is really at the time only really thinking about herself and how these problems are affecting her and not like you know at least from what i saw from the trailer not really looking into why her parents were getting a divorce or like you know just kind of what that bird meant to that yeah man. yeah what the bird meant to that man and just you know the act the, the impact of the consequences of her the impact and consequences of her action so it looks like a really nice coming of age story uh limited yeah. series type thing so kind of reminds me of those like classic like 90s coming of age where it's just like a random old person comes in to mentor like it's it it, it, it feels it feels like a john green book kind of it feels like a john green book like it has the same kind of vibe as like your paper towns or you're looking for alaska but uh yeah also i can see why brian cox did that though because he's like i need to clean my reputation a little bit after session oh yeah oh yeah i mean you know he was great as fucking uh rupert murdoch well i mean the character wasn't named rupert 
Murdoch, but is heavily based on Rupert Murdoch. Because the, the entirety of Succession is about, is like about the Murdoch family and empire. Uh, you know, and for those of you who don't know, Rupert Murdoch is the is the person who created the multimedia empire that consists of, you know, Fox News. Uh, I believe he even contributed to like CNN, a bunch, a bunch of big newspaper publications. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, like if you if you want to see some like semi modern American Game of Thrones, watch Succession. It's a phenomenal series and such an interesting character study. But uh, moving on to a brighter note, our last trailer. Uh, the Wild Dreamworks Robot. Dreamworks Wally. Yeah, it, it is straight up this DreamWorks Wally. But I'm not. But you know, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I like. I love Wally a lot, and the animation for this and the premise looks really cool. It's done specifically by the people who created How to Train Your Dragon, so I trust it's a banger. Honestly, I trust DreamWorks in general because you know, out of all the major uh, animation studios out there, DreamWorks has like you know a better track record of releasing bangers. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I got more faith. Story kind of reminds me a little bit of Bastion from Overwatch. I I never played Overwatch, so I don't really know. Uh, the story of Bastion is that he is a uh, he is a war robot who, in the middle of a war, got decommissioned in the middle of of a forest, and like the forest grew around him as he was decommissioned. And years later, he comes back online, and like animals are using his body for like nest and protection, and he realizes that and like is like a good guy now mm. but he's a former robot a war robot turned good guy that's pretty dope but yeah it, it looks it looks cool it definitely looks cool yep got a lot of famous people in it we don't need to take time to list it like i did off camera but great cast oh yeah game. yeah definitely yeah definitely look up the cast it's pretty fucking stacked yeah uh but yeah so that was trailer talk and uh even 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 though uh you know one of the guys is knocked the fuck out we are going to continue with our discussion of spaceman we, he, he just he just entered cryo sleep you know there's a, it's a long it's a long journey to the chopra Wait, cluster he knocked out again you, you, you haven't noticed that he's just not talking at all damn he must be really tired yeah i'm saying but anyway we're gonna continue and hopefully he'll wake up uh, before final thousand ratings which is kind of ironic though because considering the first time that we watched it. yeah he not he yeah he knocked out for uh, a good chunk of it yeah so uh anyway welcome to old school channel chasers and and uh we are going to start with the spoiler free section just kind of giving our general thoughts on the movie because this is one where you can't really go into detail like you need to go into detail to really explain how you feel about the movie uh so this is really gonna be pretty short uh brian i'll let you start i will say i love this movie like really good really good sort of force from uh acting wise from um adam sandler and uh scary mulligan and paul dano don't forget paul dano oh i know i know i yeah. uh, i definitely will never forget paul dano but, uh, also i am so sorry that i'm blanking on the name it Roz from big bang <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, his acting wasn't like anything like spectacular in this, but it didn't need to be for his character. It was nice to see him in a more serious role. Yeah. Like, he wasn't for laughs at all. Uh, and he's a good, serious actor. I'll see him in more stuff. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, uh, But, uh, but yeah, overall, you can tell that it's done by the Chernobyl guy, because... Oh, yeah. It's very, res it's very respectful to the foreign... Yeah, and uh, and, and also, like, it, it, it also highlights the, uh, you know, the flaws of, you know, er early... Well, humans and, like, early Eastern Europe during, like, the Cold War era and the, you know, the the major era of oh. the uh communist party and such oh oh yeah but uh but yeah um also uh marie i think her name's marina Baccarin. oh uh, boss oh marie oh she doesn't she didn't look she didn't look like marina Baccarin. marina Baccarin was a uh, fucking wasn't that her from deadpool and believe, and and, yeah. and gideon oh then i'm thinking of a different marina then but she was oh. great as like the the greedy the greedy boss who Seems like actually cared, but also cared about the bottom. I was gonna say she cared, but she cared for the wrong reason. Definitely glad to see you're awake, Tony. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. So with me, I have a love hate relationship with this movie. <laughs> oh yeah. Cause, cause like I love the movie in terms of messaging and 
terms of cinematography, in terms of acting and performances, but I also hate the movie because it features D-Base and a giant fucking talking spider. And so like, you know, there are parts of it where I just had to close my eyes and listen to Hanusha's dialogue because like, yo, arachnophobia is a real bitch. Mm -hmm. um, uh, by the way, side note, the actress that I was thinking about mm -hmm. is uh, Isabella Rosalini. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. But yeah, so like, I, I really did enjoy the movie though, but like, if you're afraid, if you're afraid of spiders as badly as I am, uh, like, get a pillow to hide behind or somebody to hug. Like, this shit was, man, whew, it's a lot. Also, like, it's a very, it's a very effective, like, kind of look at how therapy should be handled. Um, speaking as, you know, somebody who went to school for psychology, you know, like, Hanush really focused on, like, not leading Jacob and not leading Jacob to his to his breakthrough he was more focused on you know Jakob discovering it himself yeah which is you know what the overall goal and mission statement of therapy should always be you know therapists aren't genies or magic that can give you the answer to your problems they're just kind they're just sherpas on your mental health journey to figure out what the fuck you need to fix yourself or not even fix but like improve yourself oh yeah uh so yeah i enjoyed it in that regard immensely a very very good film uh so tony well what were your initial thoughts of Spaceman? Oh, Jesus Christ. Not, not again. Down. Oh, man. Oh, man. And he hit the can he hit the canvas like three times in like 10 minutes, man. Um, man must be really tired. I know. No, I was awake. Oh, OK. I was. Uh, were you muted? No, because we didn't we didn't hear shit, dude. Oh, no, I was I was adding point. No, nah, uh, yeah, we did. We didn't hear shit. Your your icon wasn't lighting up. So we, he, he said, Tony, what did you think about it without spoilers? And then dead silence. Yep. No, nope, I was awake. We were just commenting on it. Yeah. Well, oh, no, it, it was it was just weird because, you know, we weren't hearing any comments from you and your icon wasn't yeah, even was... your icon wasn't even lighting up. So weird. I was making some comments. Didn't even pick it up. Mm. So without spoilers. Link, what do you think about the movie? Beautifully made film. Great way to explore trauma in the most fantastical way possible. And I mean that in a more surreal, explorative fantasy sense. Mm -hmm. And not in the way that most people use that word now. Mm -hmm. I mean, when your guide to self-discovery is uh, <laughs> a giant talking spider, yeah. you, 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 you find unique things about it, you know? Mm -hmm. it, just, it, just con it just confirms my prevailing thought of yep, I'm never going to space. Mm -hmm. Unless, like, mm -hmm. you know, actual sustainable safe space travel is a thing but you know that might not be in my Unless lifetime like star trek yeah yeah or definitely. or like or you know reed richards designed something mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, so that's pretty much it for the spoiler free section. We're going to go ahead and just jump right into spoilers. So, uh, we definitely recommend that you go see Spaceman. It's very good. Uh, like, like I said before, if you enjoy a more dramatic Adam Sandler, you should definitely check this out. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to give the usual countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Okay, so we're going to tackle this basically by kind of just talking about Jakob's journey of self-discovery along the way to the Chopra cloud and, uh, you know, just kind of like discuss our feelings on it. So we'll start from the beginning. Um, and like just kind of the, the fact that, you know, right off the bat, we, we see one of the biggest prevailing themes of the movie which is loneliness um and like you can just tell from adam sandler's delivery as Jakob in just those first opening minutes how dead inside he is and how like lonely and isolated he feels mm -hmm. yeah. and like you know it's it's definitely also a credit to the sound design as well just the the constant ambient noise but other than that it's just head silent oh yeah beautifully put together for sure for sure um oh yeah and then you know we get we get to the point where we meet the talking space spider who is eventually named hanush but we're just going to refer mm -hmm. to him as as hanush at, at uh from this point on we end up meeting yeah. we end up meeting hanush and hanush has these abilities to essentially like telepathically link with Jakob and like experience his memories alongside him and mm -hmm. so through this plot device 
we get more background on Jacob as a person and kind of what events in his life really shaped him into the man that he is today. Yeah, and he does specifically say that said loneliness and said despair is what attracted him to him. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Hanush empathized with that because he himself, you know, felt the very same way. Uh, but his was less voluntary yeah yeah um and you know one of the major through lines of these memories is like analyzing Jacob's relationship with his wife uh Lenka and uh it's very interesting it's very interesting from a relationship perspective because like it's one it's one of those cases where um the uh you know one one partner in the relationship uh engages in like avoidant attachment which kind which leaves the other to feel alone and or inadequate um and you know what i mean by avoidant attachment you know for anybody who you know doesn't want to pick up a psych textbook or google it uh avoidant attachment is an attachment style usually developed by people who um have a negative experience early on in either their infancy or childhood with connection to their parents and so they've developed a defense mechanism where you know how they protect themselves from rejection and being hurt is by closing themselves off and keeping distant because if they they feel like if they open up they're just gonna leave themselves vulnerable to get hurt like everybody else has hurt them in their life uh, who has hurt them in their life uh, and that's clearly the case for Jakob um, mm -hmm. you know because like you know uh, as we saw throughout the different flashbacks of his life he's a you know he's a victim of circumstance uh, on several levels you know like he had to pay for the sins of his father you know his father being an informant for the communist party uh, and you know he got the brunt of it you know like he he was tossed into a river and almost drowned uh he basically watched his father and his home burn because of the angry mob and so you know he developed this need to do something great and worthwhile to atone for his father's past sin mm -hmm. and at the end of the day uh like the key to him understanding his relationship with Lenka and his you know the major flaws in it was a journey of forgiveness really like forgiving his father for what he had done and more importantly forgiving himself for putting that unnecessary pressure on himself and not just letting himself be happy yep because mm -hmm. like part of his statement is that he just obsessed about this uh statement that he had in his head where he wanted a Jupiter mm -hmm. and he focused on that and his relationship his uh mental health his sleep schedule yeah uh, like, um, like even when we start it's clear that he's uh like that sometimes you have that mentality like on the random street someone asks you how you are and you just say i'm okay or i'm good i'm good thanks yeah yeah it's just it's just, just it's just kind of your canned response because you know they're just asking out of politeness they don't really care so yeah why are you gonna do like yeah mm -hmm. everything oh yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. and like it you know this man is just like on autopilot mm -hmm. apparently my phone kicked me out of the conversation ah oh, that's what happened but yeah, I, mm -hmm. as I was interjecting and I may be like sleeping on it off and on. That's that's part of the problem. But apparently my phone decided maybe you had enough conversating for today. Oh, OK. Um, So like my uh, my pre my previous point was like, I also really enjoy that it explores loneliness from the angle of Lenka as well, Um, which, mm -hmm. you know, I will I will freely admit at first I uh, I was kind I was kind of against her because it felt very much like a, a dear john type story or or a dear yeah. or a dear john letter and you know as as someone who you know has grown up with you know several basically every male member of his family in the military like i i have a i have a real distaste for that kind of shit oh definitely and uh so you know at first i was i was very against lenka but then when i when i saw how this dude was really acting i was like no lenka made the right decision mm -hmm. but you know then her mom brings up a really good point of like you know uh like you know it's really hard to raise a kid alone and you know you you didn't yeah i don't think you really kind of gave him a chance to try you kind of just assumed that he was distant because of you and not because of him Mm -hmm. Oh boy, there's there some trauma there. Oh, lots and lots of trauma. But 
Also, I do like that they did they did the thing that sometimes happens when you're going through like mental journeys yourself, mm -hmm. and it's just like how a random nobody can say something that'll just make it click in your head. Oh yeah, like uh, when she went to that like pregnant commune thing, mm -hmm. and the single mother mentioned about how lonely it must be up there. Yeah, and I th and I think that you know that's what really you know made it sink in for Lenka, and like you know it's very true because like that's why people go to therapy in the first place they're you know a therapist is an outsider so they are completely free of any internal or external biases that a friend or a family member would have because they already know you and they have you know either consciously or unconsciously formed their opinion and kind of you know thought basis of you and you know it's it's going to take a lot to change that but a therapist is effectively a stranger who gets to know you over time and then you know kind of builds that rapport poor and you know helps you figure your stuff out mm -hmm. uh so you know go to therapy everyone mm -hmm. highly recommended uh but yeah so like i and like probably the best scene of the entire movie at least for me i can't you know i can't speak for these fellas but my favorite scene in the entire movie was when um peter leaves the satellite phone in lenka's room and he's like you know all he's asking is for you to listen i'm gonna just leave this mm -hmm. here i'll be outside just let me know when you're done and adam sandler just just like acts his yeah. ass off mm -hmm. and the difficult thing is is most of it we're just seeing the receiver yeah like can like he's not he doesn't have anyone to act off of right but he's still able to give this amount of passion and sadness and just kind of broken heartedness regret and it's just it's palpable like man it was that, it was a, that that scene was so great the way he handled it was perfect because it was essentially you don't need to say anything i just need you to listen and realize realize that i fucked up mm -hmm. And show you that I realized. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, it was so sincere and genuine that I was like, oh, come on, Linka, you, you can't leave after that. Uh, and, then, mm -hmm. and then all of that led to Probably. after the Koreans saved him and they had that like genuine back and forth. Yep. And also like, you know, uh, you know, on top of that, we had like one of the saddest scenes in the entire movie with the death of Hanush, mm -hmm. which was like super profound and like the, the the little callback with the nutella was so sweet mm. pun intended pun intended yes <laughs> always and like you know i might be terrified of hanush like you know appearance wise and you know physical form wise but like i loved the character so it was very sad mm. to see him go when uh when they have their first hug jay's like yeah i probably would have hugged him too not for that long but yeah, I know. Give him like a five. Oh, I'd give him like a five second one arm hug. I wouldn't have did the the full on. This is my friend friendship hug for like I counted like twenty seconds. And the whole entire thing of uh, it coming all full circle there because his whole entire thing was that uh, he never listened to Lanka and never put her before the job, even when she was going through a crisis herself mm -hmm. with the whole miscarriage and everything. Yep. And, but, uh, yeah, and like, and, and, Hanush, yeah, I was just about to say, yeah, when Hanush like, you know, eventually just was like, no, I, I understand Lanka now. You're, you're just a self-absorbed asshole. I'm no longer interested in you. But, but then also at the end where he like finally for once in his life puts someone above him and tries to go out and save Hanush. Yeah, yeah. because like one of the most poignant exchanges between uh, Jakob and Hanush was like when it, uh, he mentioned like, you know, about when he talked about the uh, the disease that's like ravaging him and stuff. And he goes, you know, why didn't you tell me? He said, you know, it's because you never asked. And I mean, that's, that's kind of the key to like all problems, you know, with like... For for example, like people who are dealing with depression and uh, suicidal ideation, right? You know, most of the time your friends are like, why didn't you tell me? Oh shit. You know, like you should have talked to me. It's like, yeah, well, you never bothered to even check in or ask, like, how am I supposed yeah. to tell you? Yeah, but uh, luckily for us, at least with this friend group, we're not like that. Oh yeah. To the point where we're like, oh shit, haven't heard from you for days. How you doing there, buddy? Yeah, yeah, no, we, 
we we practice regular check-ins because like you know you never you never know what's happening in your friends lives so like you got you got you, got, you just gotta make sure they're all right always check on your friends folks indeed because sometimes when you're in a dark place all you need is just somebody to talk to yeah, you know, it's it's the, it's the Golden Girls theme song, you know? Thank you for being a friend. Traveling down the road and back again. Oh, it's true. You're a pal and a confidant. Uh, man, I love the Golden Girls. Anyways, uh, but yeah, I feel like that is a good segue into final thoughts and rating. So uh, we'll start with Tony. Oh, no, did his phone kick him out again? See, this Brian is the sound of silence. I bet he's like actually giving like a whole whole thing and we just can't hear him because his phone's sucking up. Darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk to you again. <laughs> All around me are familiar faces, the worn out places, the worn out places. I know, but like I associate, for some reason, I associate Mad World and uh, Sound of Silence together because they have like similar themes. I don't. I associate uh, Sound of Silence with uh, with uh, Disturbed. I also uh, I also associate uh, like oh. a. Uh, uh, hey, there he is. God damn it. Yeah. 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 No. But you're back now, so final thoughts? Yep, final thoughts and ratings. Yeah, definitely just a great film overall. I think I was on similar points to what I was going to, what y'all were saying anyway. This film is definitely an 8.5. Yeah, okay. For me. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, I fully agree. I, I'm giving it an 8.5. Uh, very solid, very thought-provoking, very well-made, excellent acting performances. The only reason I probably wouldn't give it a 9 is because the spider fuck terrifies for me it was it would have been a nine but there were some things that i liked the idea of but wasn't really too keen on the execution of it such as well i i was with you jay thinking that linko was acting a bit selfishly initially at mm. first mm -hmm. leaving a dude that went to fucking space but then as the movie continues it's like yeah it's still kind of fucked that you're going to divorce this man but you're trying to do what's good for yourself and the kid without a real gameplay mm -hmm. so you're still kind of a dick about it not really thinking too forward with an actual like hey we have a plan we got this let's go we're just like i am done I'm freaking out. Yeah. He's just a dick. Yeah, but also, like, it, it, I I believe it was done in that way to parallel both of them, right? And I, I, I noticed the comparison. I I could see what they were trying to do, but it kind of, I think it much much to do with any other relationship. There's some things that are, you could parallel to a degree, and it, that loveliness was the point, mm -hmm. and I totally get it. But it just kind of painted her in a not so favorable yet petty picture. I can understand that okay. and i found that to be a bit too relatable because it's the type of it's the type of loneliness that you only saw yourself trying to get out of the situation in the cleanest most easy for you way than being more upfront about it you know oh yeah no i i i used to be the king of passive aggressive breakups so totally get that so that, that was kind of just my whole issue but as like i said the film continue on and she just kind of really puts some thought into what he must have gone through and what he wasn't really saying and just thought to herself huh i'm finding myself i'm going on this journey and then at the end where it became more where they kind of reconciled that was beautiful mm -hmm. really love but an 8.5 <laughs> oh, i got you i got you so brian you are the final member of the panel to give your final thoughts and ratings well i love in in general acting to force uh like not like uh let me phrase it this way i love movies where you have to like push the actor and just really rely on like one or two actors like uh last year uh one of my favorite films um uh, from last year was like i think it was called no one will help you oh. and, it was, and it was just a uh i told you about it it's mm -hmm. a movie like a horror sci-fi movie but no one speaks any dialogue for the whole movie and mm. you just have to rely mostly on one actress and her visual acting and I love shit like that so I'm a little bit a little bit extra biased here which is why the old the trend continues and I'll give it a flat nine all right okay, okay. so uh, there you have it folks we uh spaceman definitely got the channel chaser seal of approval um mm -hmm. oh yeah and uh yeah like like I said you know several times throughout this recording you know go see it it's great definitely worth your time beautifully made film so brian why don't you tell the folks at home what we'll be covering on the next episode 
Well, kind of interesting because we're going from one of Jay's fears to another one. Oh, because, no. because this one was being about trapped out in space, and this next one is kind of about being trapped in a ship because well, we are doing death and other details so uh you know quick clarification my my fear is of deep ocean and deep water i'm cool with ships mm. i'm cool with ships uh, you know i grew up a navy oh, brat segue i could come up with no i know it's fine but I, I, I just wanted to clarify you know i, I grew up and i grew up a, i grew up a navy brat so you know i i'm i'm pretty accustomed to ships but yep this yacht goes over a deep heavy ocean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As do most as do most ships. Well, when you go from an acting tour de force in space to a quirky murder mystery on a ship, <laughs> I mean it's yeah. hard to do segue. That's not true. You could have said, Well, we're go we you know, we uh, we uh you know experienced a uh you know profound mission in deep space, but now we're taking a little light break and going on a cruise. With murder. See? Segwaying isn't that hard. No. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So we reacted to the trailer to this. It looked really fun. Uh, Violet Bean and... What is that actor's name again? Mandy. Mandy Patinkin. Uh, you know, do it, doing this, like, murder mystery on a cruise where he's, like, subtly training this young thief how to become... Uh, how to, you know, turn her life around and become a proper detective. Mm-hmm. Like, it, lo it looks cool. It looks cool. I'm definitely looking forward forward to checking it out i believe it's peacock nope hulu hulu gotcha so you know we'll be checking that out and then we'll be covering it on the next episode of the channel Tish podcast we so until then we hope you guys enjoyed the episode and we will catch you later godspeed everyone